Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Welcome back to the second week of our webinar uh, on monitoring tropical storms for emergency preparedness. As we saw last week, we had an overview of tropical storms and their impacts. Today, we are going to focus on monitoring tropical storm conditions during and after storms. Just a reminder here, um, and I want to point out this RSET website of, for all the webinar material. When you go on this site, you will see um, both the presentation slides available, not just in English, but also in Spanish. So please, if you want to download them or later on, if you want to look at them, they will be there. Um, there is homework there uh, today. And uh, you can uh, find that on this site as well. You will have a Google Form link to which you will be answering your questions. And more importantly, here is the uh, information about certificate of completion. Those of you who have attended both the webinars and who complete homework assignments for both uh, week one and two, uh, you will receive a certificate. Uh, and it takes about two months to process everything, so please be patient. And even if you have not received after two months, then you can contact Marinas Martins. She is the one who uh, sends you certificates electronically. Uh, one more thing, uh, all the webinars are, are recorded and the recordings can also be found at the same site. So later on, you can go back and view certain portions if you like or you can look at the entire webinar again um, if you need to. So here is the outline for session two. We're going to start with a brief review of last week's material, uh, mostly definition about storm intensity, uh, what are the impacts, major impacts, etc. Then we will go on to looking at data which help monitoring winds, precipitation, storm surge, as storm is right um, going to make landfall or it's right near your area or over your area, which are the data sets that are useful. Then we're going to talk about flooding, monitoring flooding during and after storms. And this is very important for emergency preparedness, response and relief planning. And we're going to talk about a number of tools as shown here, uh, extreme rainfall detection system, uh, global flood monitoring system, uh, the flood observatory or Dartmouth flood observatory. There is a near real time flood monitoring and mapping tool based on MODIS data. Uh, also synthetic aperture rate uh, imagery uh, that we that helps look at flooding. We will also see how to access those. And finally, we will have examples of uh, NASA remote sensing data applications um, in tropical storm conditions. We'll also have demonstration of case study Hurricane Harvey. Last week, we already saw as Harvey was approaching Texas coast, uh, we followed it using MODIS and Weir's imagery. We also looked at iMERGE precipitation or GPM iMERGE precipitation as the storm was approaching. Today, we're going to talk about once the storm is on land, that's Harvey, uh, how the flooding and storm surge, how do they uh, occur and how, how can we monitor those uh, during and after uh, hurricane? So that's how uh, today is going to unfold. So we'll start from review session one. We talked about different intensity, uh, that tropical depression, storm, typhoon, and major hurricanes. They are all defined based on uh, wind, uh, speed associated with them and as you uh, from depression about 61 kilometer per hour all the way to 178 kilometer per hour for major hurricane um, so these are the categories we talked about and when you go to national hurricane center or joint typhoon warning center or uh, pacific hurricane center you would see warnings or watch uh, and it says the depression storm typhoon, hurricane, so you know what the strength of this storm is. And we also saw last week how damage uh, occurs when wind speed goes up. We talked about this Sefer 
Simpson wind scale, uh, which is different hurricane categories, or these are the super typhoons. Again, uh, from 74 or 109 kilometer per hour all the way to greater than 252 kilometer per hour, these are the major hurricane categories. So basically, when you see a forecast with these uh, names or categories, you know that it's the wind scale or wind speed that's going to be how much and how much damage it might cause. We talked about uh, impacts of tropical storms, and we saw that uh, Southeast Asian region um, and the Western Pacific region, uh, have they have substantial um, uh, mortality because of storms and of impacts because of storm also in America. So one thing to note here that it's the storm surge and flooding on land because of rain, they cause major deaths. This is true for um, US for sure based on data and this is general experience everywhere else that it's the flooding that really, really causes um, deaths and damage and destruction. And so that is why what we're going to do is as we talk about storms today, we're also going to talk about flooding related to these storms. Because they, it, that's how uh, even after the storm goes, flooding uh, remains there and all the relief and response has to occur after the storm passes through also. So that's what we're going to focus on. We talked about uh, how to monitor an approaching storm. We talked about precipitation data from GPM iMERGE. We looked at the tool Giovanni. Um, and this tool, we, we could animate data on daily basis as the storm emerges. You find out that there is a storm uh, nearby. You can start monitoring rainfall daily. And as it comes closer to the area you are, you can start monitoring half hourly precipitation. Um, and uh, then we talked about GEOS 5 model which provides winds and sea level pressure, not only in near real time, but also there is forecast. So you can see how forecast changes and keep monitoring as the storm approaches. We talked about, uh, we looked at worldview and Terra and Aqua Modis and uh, Sumi National Polar uh, Partnership VIRS. Uh, we talked about clouds and reflectance, how images show storm track or storm movement. Uh, and we also had a brief look at nightlight imagery, uh, how uh, power outage can be detected or using various nighttime imagery. And we will see a couple of examples today how that can be used too. Then we talked about um, a GDAX tool, which is Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System. And uh, that is based on satellites, models, media report, and this is um, very useful for looking at quick alerts as soon as a storm starts, it starts talking about it and near real time information has come in, uh, you can see from this side. So we talked about this last week. And today now we are going to switch to looking at winds, precipitation, storm surge. And for this presentation slide, I'm going to focus on Hurricane Matthew. This was a major hurricane that did a lot of damage, and some of you may have already um, known about it or were in area where you were influenced by Hurricane Matthew uh, in Caribbean also, and all the way to US and in North Carolina, there was major flooding related to Hurricane Matthew. So we will use this case to see how different parameters can be monitored. Um, so this dates were September 28th to October 9th, 2016. But when you are in real time situation, you can use the same tools and same data to follow a storm or when a storm is in your area, uh, just look at this data to see what's going on. Again, this is uh, operational centers we talked about last time, like National Hurricane Center, Central Pacific Hurricane Center, Joint Typhoon Warning Center. They provide early warnings uh, for hurricane cyclones and typhoons in different areas. They provide tracks, forecast maps, and probability of, of wind, how it's going to be, how much in what area. And uh, you can see in here, this is again Hurricane Matthew, 
uh, September 28th to October 6th. And what you see from National Hurricane Center, um, it shows how um, the, the track is, you can see for, starting from here, and here is, as, as you go forward in time, you can see uh, the probability of um, area it, that gets larger, it starts from here, and then so this is general area that you would expect uh, impact of hurricane to be. As it moves uh, closer to land, you, you would be monitoring this for warnings, and then once it makes landfall also, you, you have this area where it is impacted. So this information is available from um, operational centers. But once you start seeing that a hurricane is here or it's approaching, we talked last week how to monitor rain and wind associated with them. Once it is there, you continue to use the same data like GPM iMERGE and GEOS5 data to see how precipitation is and how winds are, what kind of sea level pressure lower the pressure of the center of the hurricane, you are going to have a strong uh, wind or a stronger intense hurricane. So we will see I-merge precipitation here. This is again uh, Hurricane Matthew. This is just similar to what we saw last time. It's an animation of daily precipitation between 20, September 29th to October 11th. And you can see the storm moving in. Uh, it, it comes in here. It really played a big role in this area, and then it moved uh, over the U.S. Haiti was really, really uh, devastated by this uh, hurricane. And so you can see the movement of this hurricane as it moves up, makes landfall, and then it North Carolina, so South Carolina and North Carolina, they had major flooding because of this storm. And here, this is accumulated precipitation from October 6th to 10th over North Carolina. This is again using the Giovanni tool that we saw last time. And as you can see, uh, this is in um, the total accumulation is almost like 200 uh, millimeters for this. E in, in the coastal region, it's a lot more, even in interior. And I want you to uh, notice Lumberton, which really got flooded. So if you are at uh, any location, not only you start looking at iMERGE precipitation every half hour, and also you can go to Giovanni and pick a point closest to where you are. In this case, we have picked Lumberton, North Carolina, and here is the latitude longitude associated with this particular place or around it. This data are one tenth of a degree, so it's about 10 kilometer resolution. So it is not super high resolution, but it gives you overall impression or idea of where major rainfall is going on and how it's evolving. So he just shows a picture on 9th October how much flooding there was. And by using Giovanni and looking at this one grid point and looking at the time series, this is from 8th October to 12th October, you can see that in millimeter per hours, rainfall was very high in the later 8th of October as storm passed through the area and almost 30, 35 millimeter per hour. And then it came down, but that's when the flooding occurred following this major rainfall so if you're monitoring uh, rainfall using iMERGE, not only uh, using Giovanni, but you can also see um, precipitation measurement uh, mission website. And I just want to um, bring that up to remind you uh, how to look at every half hour, latest half hourly precipitation. You can go in, like there's a storm here in Southern Indian Ocean that you can see right now. So every half hour you can monitor, you can view past seven days of animation, how rainfall evolved, if you like. But when the storm actually is occurring, your, your main interest is in monitoring every half hourly rainfall in your area where you are. 
So by, by looking at the images, and if you are more interested, then doing the analysis using online tool, you can keep monitoring how uh, every half hour rain is changing. And as soon as you start seeing increase in rainfall, at the same time, you will, you will also experience winds uh, outside. Uh, then you can start planning uh, what to do following this rainfall, in addition to listening to all the warnings that you get from operational centers. So during the storm, you can still monitor all this uh, data. Next is uh, winds. So precipitation, which causes major flooding, in addition, winds not only have damages, but they also cause storm surge before the storm actually arrives over land. So this is GEOS 5. We talked about this last time um, to follow the uh, rainfall. But here is last time we just saw um, maps of uh, winds and sea level pressure. Here, we also have access to this data. Uh, there's a little bit of work needed, but once you access this data, you can look at um, near real time and forecast uh, winds and sea level pressure right at the area of your interest. So you can look at maps by uh, going to this site, as we saw last time. You can do animation of winds and sea level pressure as well. But what we're going to see just is that how can you uh, just access the digital data and then see. Uh, so this is the site where all the data sets are. You have year and month and you have day. So you can pick 8th or 9th of October here for Hurricane Matthew. And then you have all the hourly data available uh, from this site. So once you click on that, you can have either near time or forecast data. You can pick month, day, and uh, forecast also. So in near real time, you would just go to today's date. And then uh, if you need forecast, you can pick appropriate file based on the hour and um, date and month. Once you go to the file, uh, you would be picking a file name which has SLV, a single level data. We are looking at surface uh, wind speed and also looking at sea level pressure. So we want to look at SLV data. And you can go to this um, site to, to find out all about file name convention. Um, but basically, for winds and sea level pressure, it's the single level file is what, or SLV files is what you want to look at. And one more thing that we're going to use to see these winds is a visualization um, tool that's called Penoply, and that's available from NASA GIS. You can download and install this. It's a very simple step. You can go to this site, look at uh, the version that's good for your operating system on your computer, and just download and install it in just a few minutes. And once you download this single level file on your computer by clicking on it, you can save it on your computer. Um, and then you can use Penoply to actually visualize the data. Once you have Penoply, you can open these files, whether they are in HDF format or they are NetCDF format. Penoply can handle those. And so quickly, you can plot wind speed and wind vector, as shown here. This is on 9th of October. And you can see um, major wind speed was, uh, this is shown here is in meters per second. Um, pretty large, as you can see, 20 to about 25 meters per second. And here is the sea level pressure in hectopascal or pascal. Uh, so the yellow part is about 998 uh, hectopascal. Uh, so this is quite low pressure uh, compared to normal. And so you can um, quickly just, uh, if you are on the GEOS 5 site, Every hour, uh, uh, you can 
see near real time data or you can uh, download and use Penapply to actually be more quantitative um, uh, to see uh, where, how much wind uh, speed will be there or, or what kind of sea level pressure, where the center is when it's arriving on land, etc. So this allows you to monitor right when the storm is occurring. So Penapply is allows you to like do more detail over your own region. It can allow you to zoom in and focus, but otherwise you can just go to the site and look at the maps that they have on site as we saw here. So either way, it allows gives you idea of how much winds there are and there is also forecast. Very important thing is monitoring storm surge. So this is um, not very easy. A model has to be used in which a number of storm parameters have to be used, such as pressure, size of the storm, what kind of forward speed there is, what kind of winds and track data. So these are all required. So here in the US, NOAA uh, provides storm surge information. And that is based on a model called SLOSH, or sea, lake, and overland surge from hurricanes. And here is the site. You can find more about the model itself. And here is the uh, site where you would have a lot of information. Uh, the one that uh, to notice is this P surge, or probabilistic hurricane storm surge. So that is what uh, gives you um, information about how storm surge is going to be. So this P surge for Hurricane Matthew. And if you can see on left hand side, you will see that there is a how much probability there is that is given. Here's the uh, percent probability of uh, storm surge exceeding. Uh, you can choose it is exceeding three feet. Uh, exceeding a height, you can choose the number you want here. And you can also uh, have a cumulative, um, and this is for Hurricane Matthew, as I said, you can see that it, this is, um, here you can see that probability of hurricane is like small. As you go here, a surge greater than three is, is shown here, very high probability over here, or more than 98% that definitely storm surge will be about normal greater than three feet. And then as you go up north, uh, probability uh, is going down. And this is, uh, this just the time is shown here, what time it is. So you can, if you go online, you can also see a little animation or you can uh, look at what the maximum surge probability. So a lot of information here. So as soon as a storm starts, you can look at precipitation and winds and storm surge from this. If you are anywhere else in the world, not in the US, then GDAX is the, um, is the site to use. And so Joint Research Center uh, has a storm surge calculation model, and that is used to look at storm surge everywhere else. We will have a small demo at the end when we look at Hurricane Harvey. But here is where you can see that it says maximum surge. Again, this is in feet above normal, so uh, 3 to 3.5. Uh, and then here is the height maximum. Here is also maximum surge cyclone Hato, Hurricane Matthew. So. This model can be used anywhere. So for storm surge, uh, you will be using uh, either NOAA or GDAX site, uh, depending on where uh, you are located, then you can monitor storm surge. Okay. So next, we want to talk about data which help in planning um, emergency operations. So last time we talked about uh, shuttle radar topography uh, mission terrain data. Uh, and we also saw a site, GDAX, uh, which provides access to this data. So you can download TIFF images 
depending on where you are, you can click and see. We also saw CDEC last week. This is a uh, socioeconomic data site that provides population density, um, roads, um, other infrastructure data. And this is an example of during Hurricane Matthew, and this is North Carolina again, uh, the brown uh, square here that shows SRTM train data and the heights in vertical meters are shown here. So here is obviously there is higher ground and then here as you go, um, uh, the terrain goes lower. If you can zoom in, uh, what I've done is taken uh, terrain data as well as population uh, density data, which is in, in, in given here. And this is um, in, uh, population uh, per kilometer. Uh, you can see that these are the urban centers. And I've taken all these data into a QGIS platform. So you can either just look at the uh, maps online on GDAX and uh, CDAC, or you can get the data beforehand, before even when there is no storm in your area, you can get uh, SRTM terrain data. And if you can zoom in, you will be you will be seeing features where you have a topography. You can using GIS, you can also calculate slope and see where there is lower slope or flat areas surrounded by high terrain area. Probability of flooding will be more. So before even flood starts, these data can be looked at. So you already know where the major population centers are, what kind of slope within the city that you can expect where uh, water logging might occur. So when um, rain starts occurring, you can actually um, expect to, uh, where uh, there'll be more flooding and where more people will be in needing help or rescue or warning if, if it's not that strong storm. But these data are also very useful for emergency planning and they are available freely online for uh, you to download even before actually any storm occurs or any emergency occurs. Okay, so we talked about during and even after, these are some of the tools you always use to monitor a storm. So winds, precipitation, storm surge, we, and the, the additional data like terrain and population. So in the beginning, we talked, we saw the impact is most, mostly in terms of flooding. So either because of storm surge or also because of um, rainfall over land. So it helps to see where there is flooding going on. And so we're going to talk in some detail about different flood monitoring tools. Okay. So remote sensing based flood detection can occur in three different approaches. As shown here, the first one is detailed hydrologic modeling that can provide you stream flow and runoff over ground. So uh, how much water there will be on ground because of precipitation, not just precipitation, but depends on soil moisture condition, terrain. So a number of parameters, um, they decide uh, uh, how much uh, stream flow or runoff there will be. And quantitative information can be derived by using hydrologic modeling forced by weather data. So that's one way. Another thing is inferring flooding based on precipitation so that you have long climatological record of precipitation at a location. When you, when you keep monitoring um, precipitation, it exceeds certain level, then you know that there will be flooding based on past data. And so that's inferring flooding based on precipitation. So there's no modeling involved. It just looks at the data and looks at the past data and so that's uh, one way. Another thing is to look at um, just land surface and then decide whether it's dry or wet. So 
we will see a tool that uses optical data. Um, it looks at land surface, and then it can detect when there is inundation on previously dry surface. So these are three approaches that um, NASA tools use to look at flooding in different ways. And it's important to note that, that, that um, a lot of additional information is needed too for these flooding tools, but these are the basic principles, either rainfall or it is looking at the surface. Okay? And uh, RSET had a detailed webinar, advanced webinar of flood monitoring, and here's the link that if you want more information about these tools and how to monitor flooding, you can always go back and look at uh, these um, webinar webinars. So we're going to start. We're going to look at um, precipitation-based flood tools. Uh, and first of all, there is one tool that we will see. It's called Extreme Rainfall Detection System, or ERDS. This is the second type of flooding tool that it it infers uh, potential flooding based on GPM iMERGE data. The iMERGE data that we've been talking about. Um, and then there is another tool, which is the first kind, which uses a hydrologic model and rainfall to give stream flow and runoff, that is global flood monitoring system. GFMS uses TRIM multi-satellite precipitation analysis, or TMPA. We talked about this product last week. You may want to review it. It's the TRIM was the predecessor of GPM, and uh, with TRIM data along with another, uh, other constellation data, we have multi-satellite TMPA data at 25, uh, 0.25 degree by 0.25 uh, degree latitude longitude, or 25 kilometer square data. GFMS uses that and provides um, a hydrologic model, and then you provide stream flow and runoff. GFMS will also be transitioning to iMERGE soon. Once we have like long TMP iMERGE data, uh, combined data available for more than 20 years, we talked about this last week. Okay, so we will start with a brief review of extreme rainfall detection system. This actually was developed by uh, Itaka Web. Here is the website. And this tool uh, is for emergency preparedness for World Food Program. This is the UN program. And so what it provides is quick alerts. It uses near real-time GPM iMERGE data. We saw that available from Giovanni or PMM site. Every half hour, it is available. In addition, ERDS also uses NOAA Global Forecasting System, rainfall. So near real time comes from iMERGE, and there is forecast component that comes from NOAA GFS, and it provides alerts of potential flooding where there could be, because of extreme rainfall, there could be potential of flooding. And it uses rain gauge data, or Global Precipitation Climatology Center land-based rain gauge data to, to decide um, whether near real time or forecast rain is going to be much higher than long term mean data. And based on that, it, it provides alert as shown here, the red areas. Um, these are all based on precipitation that that's where potential flooding is. Okay. So as shown here, it provides uh, cumulative precipitation. The one that's shown here in light colors is precipitation. N in near real time, it is from iMERGE. Um, and if it is forecast, then it is from GFS. And you have a way to choose it. Uh, you can look at accumulated rainfall from iMERGE from last 24 hours all the way to about 96 hours. And you can go forward uh, from GFS and look at precipitation. And based on that, alerts are provided. And as you can see, these red areas is where there is potential of flooding. This snapshot, of course, was taken on 15th of April. But we're going to look at this site a demonstration at the end. Uh, we'll see how ERDS can be used to quickly look at um, near real time, as well as forecast rainfall, and where the flood potential is. 
this is somewhat an experimental product which is because that has also switched from TMPA to iMERGE. So uh, it's important to do local verification in the sense that uh, when there's a lot of rain in your area, you can go to ERDS and see uh, how closely it matches your experience on ground. But in, um, generally, the alert areas are pretty accurate that it provides that, okay, here is where there's high potential of flooding because of rainfall. So this is ERDS. This is available in near real time and forecast only. The next tool, Global Flood Monitoring System. This has not only near real time data, but it also has archive data based on TMPA. So this, because it's based on trim, it provides data between 50 south and 50 north. That's where we are interested for tropical storms. It provides um, multiple parameters it provides instantaneous rain rate for three hours, can accumulated rain rate for rainfall for 24 to 168 hours, which is seven days. So you can look at changing rainfall accumulated over different time period, which causes flooding. And stream flow rates and flood intensity are derived at about 12 kilometer resolution. Um, also available at one kilometer, but that is more or less in near real time, this short time. If you want to look at a long term data, 12 kilometer data are available. And this tool is available since 2013. So at this point, uh, it's important to note that we talked about this last time that trim satellite is no longer flying, uh, but based on past uh, trim climatology, there is calibration derived for other national and international satellites carrying microwave uh, sensors. And they are calibrated with trim data. And uh, so the TMPA continues because quite a few applications used TMPA. So until they all can switch to iMERGE, um, TMPA are being available. And so that is being used. Uh, from um, for GFMS. It uses TMPA plus. There is a model, GeoSphy model that we've been talking about. It also is used for reanalysis in which satellite data are assimilated and near real time data, weather data are available. That's called MERA or Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications. So MERA data provide uh, uh, winds, um, soil moisture, uh, a number of information, and then uh, variable infiltration capacity model um, is used to get stream flow and runoff. There is a runoff routing model, and there is a reference provided here that provides details, um, you know, how the model is set up and uh, what kind of routing scheme is used to get uh, stream flow um, and runoff also. Uh, RSET also had a webinar on WIC, um, so you can go back to the site and see um, how, what is involved in getting stream flow from variable infiltration capacity model. So we are going to have a demo at the end of this site, but basically it provides um, capability of zooming into any region by using zoom in and zoom out feature. You can pan the map and go to a particular area. You can select area, not only that, any 12 kilometer grid is, you can choose by latitude and longitude, and uh, you can choose particular time uh, range between which you can monitor flooding. There is near real time and past. You can pick uh, start time and end time, and you can animate and see how stream flow and runoff they change. Um, here is where you can pick different variables. Um, most important is flood detection depth. So it provides depth above a threshold in, in millimeters. So higher it is, um, stronger the flood is and we will 
this is the example for Hurricane Matthew. We'll see that for Hurricane Harvey at the end. Um, this is uh, 9th October, uh, 12Z. You can see here is after the storm has hit this area, you can see where there are flood depth exceeding more than about 200 millimeters. There are locations uh, where 20 to 50, you see many. Um, there's some where about 100 millimeter uh, exceeds flood depth. And so this allows you to look at, zoom in and look at any location, any one pixel and see how actually flood depth changes. So uh, you can, this is for past, but in near real time also, you can get the same information. So we talked about ERDS and GFMS, both are rainfall based uh, flood detection tool. In one case, you just get alerts based on rainfall. In this case, you actually get uh, flood depth, intensity, and you can also see this green area, which is runoff outside the river channel, you would see uh, that's where you would expect um, flooding to occur. Okay. Next, we talked about uh, land cover based flooding tools. And they are uh, the one that we're going to talk about is based on MODIS. MODIS, we talked about this satellite, uh, it's a moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer with um, many, um, about 36 spectral bands. But you can see fr from this chart here that when you look from the satellite and we, when we looked at worldview and we were monitoring um, storms like Harvey, uh, we saw that clouds, you can see, you can see ocean, you can see land. and so. MODIS allows you to see soil, vegetation, and water in different uh, spectral bands. And so this is being used to detect where there's flooding going on. So uh, there are two tools. That is uh, MODIS near real-time flood mapping, and there is Dartmouth Flood Observatory or the Flood Observatory. It uses the same information with some additional data to provide uh, flooding information. So uh, what uh, is done is that MODIS data for a long time they're used to detect permanent water. And then as flooding occurs, the heavy rainfall occurs or a storm passes through, then you can see that the difference with that, um, that permanent water can tell you areas where there is no permanent water, but there is temporary water resulting from flooding. So here is an example. Um, Modis, um, this is the Mississippi River flooding in 2016. Uh, this is uh, March 15 and this is May 13. And you can see the clear difference as the flooding changes or uh, river level or width changes. So you can look at images and, and figure out where there is inundation going on. To note here is that you do not get stream flow information. So you're not getting information about how much, how river is flowing faster or how much flooding there is within the channel, but it's the area outside the water bodies where there is water, either water logging has occurred or there is spilling of water because of flooding that is detected. And that is very useful for um, planning relief operations or to see which land area are flooded because of heavy rain or because of um, re overflowing rivers. Say. And these are the bands used to derive um, uh, this flooding. One thing to notice here, that, so that the major advantage of this is that MODIS provides daily observations. So you can twice daily in many cases, so you can monitor um, surface inundation nicely. And it's a global data, so you can use it anywhere. But one thing is that it's an optical uh, sensor and it cannot see through clouds. So if there are a lot of clouds, as we saw last week, we can look at clouds and 
and see where the storm is moving. But what's going on at the surface is not very easy to see when th there are clouds. So if there is very thick cloud cover, which usually there is in hurricane, you may not be able to see flooding going on right underneath. But as the storm passes, usually there is clear sky right behind it that tells you where there is still flooding going on. So this tool, if there are gaps in the cloud, sometimes you can see through some surface flooding, but this is very useful to look at post uh, storm flooding. Uh, you can, we'll see in a demo at the end, how you can see which areas are waterlogged even after the storm has passed. So here is the website where this near real time and past flood mapping is available from MODIS. Uh, it's available at 10 by 10 degree grid tiles as shown here. Uh, and there are uh, it, it, it 250 meters resolution. And there are three types of composites available. Two day, three day, and four, last 14 days. So last so many days composites are available. That helps in eliminating some of the effect of clouds. So even if it is cloudy for two or three days, uh, you can always see last 14 days and see how flood frequency changed. And that gives you indication of where there may be inundation going on. So this uh, is helpful. Once you click on any of this um, grid, you can look at permanent water present in that grid area. You can look at flood maps um, in that area. And we will see that at the end for Hurricane Harvey, uh, how to see that. And then um, there's one thing to notice here is that not only when there are clouds present, you don't see the surface, but if there are broken clouds, and even if you are looking at some surface, there can be some cloud shadow on that land. And sometimes that can be misinterpreted as inundation. Similarly, if there is a terrain in the grid area that you are focusing on, or then terrain shadow can also be misinterpreted as surface water. So there is improvement going on constantly to, to eliminate these effects. Um, but sometimes still you might get uh, these effects in the data. So you have to be careful with that. But more or less, it does help you look at a uh, general area where inundation might be occurring. So this data are available since uh, 2013 also. So you can look at present and past data to, to study how inundation patterns are in your area of interest. So this is just a uh, showing what products are available and in what format. Uh, flood map, just image is available. Uh, flood water is available as KMZ or shapefile that you can use with GIS or Google Earth. Uh, permanent surface water is available and all these parameters are available at GeoTIFF as well. There's a lot of information on this site um, and you, there's documentation and papers that you can get more information about the tool itself. This is, again, North Carolina, Hurricane Matthew. This is October 10 to 12. Uh, this is just as hurricane passed through the area, again, focusing on North Carolina. And you can see this red dots here. If you zoom in, you can um, um, take it in as KMZ file or a shape file in GIS and really zoom in and see which streets or which areas are flooded. So it also helps look at coastal flooding. So we know we have information about storm surge. And MODIS also can detect when there is flooding going on. Uh, if not right when the storm is passing, as the storm passes and clouds clear, it can clearly show the surface where there is inundation going on. So this is um, a useful tool for uh, post uh, storm planning that where the flooding is occurring or where there is um, water logging for a long time after even the flood is gone. Another tool 
again uses uh, Modi's information is uh, the flood observatory and here's the website uh, similar information is used uh, it provides um, near real time and current and past, past flood event mapping and here it highlights red areas uh, where there is inundation occurring it uses both modis and uh, local in situ data also they use um, incorporate in there are also other satellites such as landsat 8 um, eo1 for past data it's no longer available but then there is ester flying on terra these are all uh, satellites and some instruments they provide similar information to modis that is used to look at um, whenever uh, these satellites are overpassing some area and information is available, then that is also displayed. Um, also included is Cosmo, SkyMed, and Sentinel-1 uh, radar data. Uh, they are also used to look at surface inundation. Um, these are, uh, MODIS is daily data. These satellites don't provide daily data, but whenever they are available, they are included in, in this. And um, there are multiple data sources used so even GFMS and iMERGE and TMPA information is available from this site. This shows uh, flooding due to Hurricane Matthew, and this is 14-day composite uh, from MODIS. And you can see all the red areas where there is a lot of flooding going on. Um, this is um, in, in, in Haiti, when hurricane occurred, you can see where the uh, hurricane Matthew passed through this area. You can see SAR data. This is from JAXA's ALOS Pulsar data. And um, so different, whenever different SARs are available, um, you can see the flooding also. So this is MODIS. This is a SAR. So synthetic aperture radar, we I mentioned here a couple of times SAR, but uh, some of you may already know uh, what SAR is, and you may have seen the data. Um, but it is something that that is going to be like future sensor, if you wish. Uh, it's a synthetic aperture radar. It's an active sensor. So most like MODIS or GPM, um, GPM data, or what we talked about rears. These are all passive instrument SAR. Um, is is active it's a radar um, that throws frequency on ground and then collects backscatter data and then that backscattering signal depends on what the surface is how rough it is how smooth it is what kind of terrain it is it can bounce back and forth and then go back and so information of surface is is contained in that backscatter data and so Different frequency bands are used uh, with these are the microwave frequency range and they are used for many different applications and looking at surface, especially for flooding is something that it, it's useful in addition to there are many applications in agriculture to look at soil moisture, biomass, uh, also looking at deformation because of earthquake you can see from radar. And so this is um, there are many applications. Uh, currently, um, these are these are new and these are the future satellites. Uh, so you can see that some are not freely available, but these are all the old um, satellites uh, ended. But now there is Sentinel-1 that is available uh, starting from 2014. And these are also available like um, these are the future one, uh, NISAR and biomass planned for 2021. So one advantage of SAR data is that it can see through clouds. So unlike optical sensors such as MODIS and VIRS, even if there is storm going on and there are a lot of clouds, surface can still be seen from SAR. And among many applications, disasters monitoring is, is very, very useful, as you can see. Here is where uh, there's open water. So and that these are the classification of land. Uh, you can see not inundated surface. There is blue is the open water 
and yellow is the inundated vegetation okay so that's where the water is uh, right here so looking at SAR images backscattered images one can see where uh, there is a water on um, the ground so sentinel one SAR images are freely available right now. They're available from Vertex. This is um, in Alaska. It is an Alaska satellite facility. They provide um, SAR uh, data freely. There is a tool. Uh, it's called a Sentinel Application Toolbox or SNAP. This can be used to actually um, process these images. It's a little advanced training, but as you see, uh, RSET did provide a introductory webinar um, about our background about SAR, and you can find this information at this link. And there's going to be a more advanced webinar in July of this year, uh, so that um, you can look at, um, learn to analyze SAR data, um, how to obtain the data, how to analyze image. Uh, why we're talking about this is because as we move forward, as we you know, more SARS will be available. Right now, Sentinel-1 data are available maybe every 12 days. But as we have more SAR uh, carrying satellites going up, we can have more frequent data. And that can help see through clouds and look at flooding even when there is storm going on. So this is something to keep in mind. This is an example. Um, it shows. Uh, before and after Hurricane Matthew. So this is a RGB image or red, green, blue image. Um, the way it is done is that uh, backscattered data before hurricane passed and after hurricane passed, different uh, backscattered data are used. And then the color scheme is used so that this red or this orange area is where there is flooding going on. The blue one is where the permanent water is. So even before storm, this water, of course, was there. But as the storm passed, you can see um, where inundation occurred. So this is coastal inundation, inland. Also, you can see areas, uh, all these orange areas, they show where there is surface that is flooded. So SAR images can quickly tell you, in addition to MODIS, where uh, flooding is going on, just by looking at the surface. OK. so. This brings us to some more examples where NASA remote sensing data are used. So we talked about monitoring data in near real time and in forecast mode. Also look at flooding in near real time. Um, and then um, we're going to have uh, some examples and then demos. So here's in one example where different resources from NASA were used by FEMA after Hurricane Harvey. Um, here, as you can see, after 25th was the landfall uh, day. And then after that, um, FEMA included SAR uh, for looking at flooding and also requested um, to send a SAR on unmanned um, aerial vehicle. Uh, here is where uh, constant monitoring goes on using NASA satellite data. So MODIS and VIRS, they show how clouds are, are moving in. Uh, spiral bands because of storms are moving in where there could be rain. Um, and um, so the, there's also flood um, monitoring using Cosmo SkyMid. This is from a European uh, satellite and Spot 6. So these data are available from NASA Marshall Space Flight Center showing flooding. And so uh, there, there is remote sensing products. Uh, from NASA, they are available on FEMA FTP servers. So FEMA does use uh, satellite data to monitor in near real time and also planning for post-storm um, flooding monitoring, um, optical data, also using uh, SAR data. And here is where all the data are, if you go on this site uh, that we talked about. Here is another example. This is um, changing vegetation detection. Uh, and then over Puerto Rico, that is after Hurricane Maria. This was in September 2007. So top figure shows 
pre-Maria uh, image from Landsat satellite, and you can see all the greens, which is where all the vegetation is. Uh, middle figure is post-Maria um, image, again from the same sensor on Landsat 8. And what you see is that there is heavy impact, you know, that a lot of vegetation is destroyed, and all the brownish area is where there is really no, no vegetation left. So as the, the trees uh, fall down or the, um, the vegetation is damaged, it can be seen from this data. Um, the bottom figure is the non-photosynthetic non vegetation. So that is mostly exposed wood and surface litter that you can see from uh, the satellite. This is also post um, Maria. So this is how you can quickly look at image and figure out what is going on. This is something uh, we talked about earlier. This is the nightlight imagery from um, Veers uh, flying on Sumi and PP. And you can see this is again Hurricane Maria in over Puerto Rico. These are the areas um, where urban centers are. And you can see lights at night. This is the baseline before Maria. You can see this. Uh, and just uh, after the uh, passage of storm, if you look at this area, you can see the intensity decreasing wherever. So you can see, um, if you can zoom in, you would know where um, image went dark or where the power was lost. So this is a quick way of looking at uh, power outages because of storm. And so here is a comparison, like you can see, baseline and after, if you zoom in, that where there was, here is where there is major power outage. You can see before a lot of lights. Here also there are areas, like this area had less intensity, you can see here. This area also had power loss. And so just by looking at images, comparing it to uh, before, storm, you can quickly see where a power outage is. So that's where um, um, repairs are planned quickly or if there is any help needed, it's provided. So this, is, this helps in planning um, uh, for response to the storm. Okay. Here is yet another example in which iMERGE precipitation was used to uh, track cholera risk. Um, after Hurricane Matthew, and it's a lot of information, but top is basically showing um, increase in precipitation due to Matthew, and then here, uh, uh, based on that, severity of um, cholera risk is given. So, um, and this has been validated with um, uh, data on ground that uh, this precipitation from IMERGE does help looking at post-storm um, health risks, such as cholera in this case. So this brings us to um, the demonstration part of today's presentation. Now we're going to look at a case study of Hurricane Harvey. Last week, we already saw iMERGE animation uh, showing precipitation as the storm was approaching. Today, we also show, saw how rainfall um, occurred as Hurricane Matthew passed in. And so um, we also saw sea level pressure and winds from Geos 5. Um, we saw clouds uh, from MODIS. So the focus of today's demonstration is mostly on flooding because now you already know how to monitor other parameters. But what causes a lot of damage and what requires a lot of response is really flooding that occurs because of either storm surge in coastal region or inland because of very heavy rain. So what we're going to do is use Hurricane Harvey as a case study and look at global flood monitoring system, MODIS NRT system, and um, see um, GDAX, how uh, storm surge changed due to Harvey. And so we will do that. Before we do that, however, though, I want to show you um, Extreme Rainfall Detection System, which does not have past data, but it's a useful tool for near real-time monitoring. So I'm going to switch to a demo mode.
can start with um, extreme rainfall detection system. This is the near real time error system. On the right hand side, you can have information about which day and time you're looking at, uh, which is the last analysis you're looking at from forecast. And here you have um, near real time um, rainfall information, cumulated forecast, and there are alerts in near real time and forecast. So let's see if we look at cumulative near real time. So this is a near real time, um, 12 hour, last 12 hours last 24 hours and you can of course zoom in and out and this is a storm in southern indian ocean already so these these last 96 hours of rainfall from imerge that you can see you can save the images and here is the color scale for amount of rain in millimeters that you can see so this is about uh, the the color green is about 150 to 200 uh, millimeter accumulated rain. Here it is more like 250. Similarly, you can go to the forecast, and this is forecast for next 24 hours, next 40 hours, all the way to 48 hours to 144 hours. This is based on GFMS, the rainfall. And based on that, you can see alert, near real time alert. As you go down, if you see any red area like here, you can zoom in and you see there is a red area where ERDS is saying that there is potential of flooding based on cumulative rainfall. So this is based on last 96 hours of um, rainfall you can see where all the red dots where there is flooding likely or this alert is given and similarly you can have from forecast so you can zoom out and go to different regions and see where there may be flooding like here you see in uruguay the forecast of flooding you can see so this tool is useful in looking at near real time and forecast uh, flood areas where there is going to be flooding. So that these alerts are given. So first stop when any storm occurs is really the operational hurricane centers. Then next you can look at uh, all the data from iMERGE, GEOS 5 forecast, um, Worldview, uh, MODIS images, and then for flooding, then ERDS provides near real time information. There is information about half hourly rainfall here that can give you indication where the flood might occur. And then there is global flood monitoring system. So you already have uh, seen this before, how to zoom in and zoom out and look at the rainfall and uh, here is how you pick different parameters. You have accumulated rainfall, stream flow. We're going to look at flood detection. That is the default that you see here. And I'm going to show you a little animation of stream flow that we did because of uh, Hurricane Harvey. So I basically zoomed into the Texas region. This shows uh, data in April, but you can change the dates. You can zoom in and zoom out and pan the map using the panel in the side. And here, here is where you see all the rivers. You can change the start time and end time. We're going to look at Hurricane Harvey. So 25th of August was when in, in 2017, when it first arrived over land over Texas. And here is the 
depth above threshold in millimeter, you can animate. As the storm passes, you can see how this runoff and stream flow are shown here. Here is the area where the flooding depth is above threshold by 50 to 100 meters. In some areas, as the storm moves, 28th of August, you can see almost more than 100 to 200 millimeter above threshold, you can see. So generally, the green area is where there is above threshold runoff, and then there is rivers which are flooded, and the so stream flow is shown here. So there is possibility that there is uh, riverine flooding affecting nearby area as well. So this is how you will be able to look at flooding uh, based on GFMS. This is based on hydrologic model and rainfall, so it's not affected by clouds. So even when the storm is coming in, you can start looking at near real-time data. Um, as you see here, um, the most uh, recent data will be available when you go to this site. You can zoom in and see what kind of flooding is occurring. Every three hours, you can man monitor based on TMPA data. Later on, though, based on iMERGE, this data can be available at more frequent <coughs> time. You, there is also a short-term flood forecasting based on GEOS 5 data. And so you can change the date to see forecast uh, of how uh, things are going to evolve, where there's going to be more stream flow or uh, flood above that threshold. Um, so intensity of flood can be seen too. So this is GFMS. Next, I want to show near real time uh, MODIS flood mapping. This also has past data. But you can see that whichever region there's a storm that you're interested in, you can go right to uh, that area. And once you know uh, from the MODIS imagery, look, looking through worldview and also looking at uh, iMERGE data, that storm has already come ashore, um, you can start looking at um, the region of your interest. In this case, again, as for Harvey, we are going to look at Texas. You can click on the grid, and this will have most recent available image. We're going to move back to 2017 to go to Hurricane Harvey. And you can change. These are Julian days, so year, um, day of year. So you can change that to go to August of 2017. And what you see here, this is 8th of August. We know that 25th of August when Harvey came ashore. And so following that, in GFMS, we saw that flooding started occurring and it increased around 28, 29, even 30th. And so I'm just going to pick, say, day 28. You can zoom in. Because of clouds, you may not see very much flooding going on at two uh, or three day composite, but you can use 14 day composite. So here is the blue areas show, they show permanent water. But now you can see this uh, flood occurrence. And that's where you see um, where the flood's occurring. And you can zoom in. And we're going to look at even in more detail. So you can quickly look at the image, or you can you look at flood water um, as KMZ. Uh, that is a Google Earth. You can download shapefile or TIFF file and look at, uh, get that in GIS. But in here, what we are doing is just using Google Earth to just quickly look at the image. 
and when actually storm is on the area this seems like a good strategy that you quickly look at the google earth and now you can zoom in and see where there is inundation this is 28th of august as you zoom in you can see this is houston as you zoom in to areas you can see the streets or neighborhood that are flooded this is 250 meter resolution but as you zoom in you can see here is where um, there's flooding going on based on um, Moody's imagery. So this is a quick way of identifying areas. Um, if you download this as shape file and look at it along with terrain or slope uh, data in GIS and again population density, you might be able to decide where immediate help is needed. But this is again um, sometimes even if there is uh, flooding going on and clouds can't see. Uh, post flood when the clouds clear you can wherever there is still water left in as on the surface you can identify those areas based on this modis image so this was hurricane harvey as it affected houston you can see um, several places where an inundation you can zoom in and see which roads have uh, potential of being flooded at this time and that's where you probably want to plan some uh, relief or provide warning for people not to go there. So this helps during and past um, storm flooding detection. So it's a useful tool, it's a daily data, and you can quickly look at uh, Google Earth Engine, uh, look at the KMZ file to see where there's flooding going on. We're looking at past data, but this can be available in near real time, so you can see this. So this is <clears throat> MODIS NRT. Finally, we're going to look at storm search. And I want to take this opportunity to to go through GDAX, you can see this tropical storm, Flamboyan, in southern Indian Ocean, that's occurring now. But if you go to alerts, so you can, any near real time storm you can see here, you can click on it and you can get information about that storm, like summary, you can see uh, name, uh, date, countries affected, this is offshore. So no people are exposed, but you can have information about the storm. If you want to look at the past storm, alerts is where you would go and search for the alerts. And you can pick cyclones. And you can also pick um, days and months. So we are going to look at Twenty fifth of August, when Hurricane Harvey um, was, and here also we can go to say thirtieth. Okay, so this is the date, and then you can submit, and that gives you um, here is Hurricane Harvey. You can have full report. So this is how you will find past data, but in near real time, you can go right to the site and find it. Here is where you have information, which countries affected, how many population was exposed, wind speed, how much was that? And maximum wind speed was 230 km per hour. This was category four. Maximum storm surge, 1.6 meter on 26th of August because of that. Um, and still, uh, vulnerability was considered low because uh, there was, uh, if it were somewhere in country which is not prepared or not developed enough to respond quickly, maybe there is a vulnerability is large. Um, 
And so this information can be obtained in near real time as well as for past data. But what I really wanted to point out was resources. Here is where uh, you can find storm surge data. You can download these files. This is the location and this is by hour. Uh, this is based on the JRC model that you can see uh, data, but you can also see so much other information such as um, extreme rainfall uh, associated with the storm um, based on NOAA data. And here is the storm surge. You can click on it and it shows animation. This is 26th of August. And as you can see, the storm is moving and then the storm surge is changing. This is feet above normal. And so you can, you can look at this animation to see where storm surge um, is going on and also uh, if there is, what is the maximum storm surge height? Uh, so that is shown here. Again, based on the model and uh, observed data about winds and track and size of the storm and pressure. So, so the main purpose of showing this was just to give you an overview that you will see uh, resources from different sources, so to say, uh, and you will also have storm surge information here from JRC model related to tropical storm. So this is the way to look at storm surge when storm is almost there and um, you will see a map like this where it shows where um, the rainfall, how it changed, the track, the areas affected, the flooding, the population affected. You can zoom into this map and you will get the entire report uh, about the particular storm. So this is just for your information that you can look at what the flooded areas were, where the storm surge was. So this is a summary very quickly given about a storm. As the data come in, they start putting in. So this is a useful tool. This uses NASA data, especially from MODIS um, and iMERGE, and they are used in here. Okay. So we saw GFMS, we saw MODIS NRT, and we also saw GDEX to see storm surge um, where, where you can see different storms, how uh, to monitor flooding related to that. Earlier we saw how to uh, see other parameters associated with that, such as clouds, rain, wind, sea level pressure. So uh, in, in these two weeks, I think the overall idea was to to present all the resources available from NASA that can help uh, monitor uh, storm before, during, and after, and especially focusing on rainfall and flooding, uh, how to look at storm surge. And so here's a brief summary of what we saw in these two weeks. So NASA remote sensing and Earth system model data that we saw, they augment operational tropical storm data. Um, so NASA is not doing operational um, forecasts, or it's not an operational center, but all the research quality products that are coming out of uh, satellite observations and models, um, they are very useful in um, augmenting already available information from operational centers. So once you have warnings and watches from these centers, you know the probability of winds or track then you can look at NASA remote sensing and modeling data to get more information. During initial uh, phase, uh, initiation of, then propagation, and also dissipation stage, you can see from remote sensing data. So not only remote sensing provides an overall perspective, you can look at an image and you can see uh, where the storm is and the surrounded area, it's a continuous special field that you can see as 
we saw on, in many images. And you can also zoom in to a given location like we did in North Carolina for Hurricane Matthew or in Houston for Hurricane Harvey. You can zoom into a particular area using these tools and look at winds and sea level pressure or precipitation. You can look at Modis and Weir's true color imagery using Worldview as we saw. Um, finally, you can look at river flooding and surface inundation from all these different tools that we just saw. Uh, that gives you idea of where the flooding is and where quick response might be needed. You can look at nightlight imagery again from Worldview um, and see where there is power outage. We saw an example over Puerto Rico because of Hurricane Maria, how dramatically you can see what power outages compared to a baseline or earlier image. And we also saw that storm surge information is available in the US uh, from NOAA and from JRC, this is Joint Research Center uh, from GDAX. So all, all these resources are there to, to look at um, storm in different um, phases. So storm-related emergency uh, preparedness and mitigation earlier, um, response relief, they all can benefit from combined use of all these data that we just showed. Um, weather data is there, flooding data, terrain, socioeconomic data, also storm surge data. So combination of, of these data and tools can help you in preparing of, uh, how to respond to the storm emergency. Here is something that is from FEMA that how would you prepare for a storm? What would you do now that when storm is approaching during the storm? So you prepare, survive, and then be safe afterwards. So these are the steps that FEMA recommends, which is true anywhere in the world where storms are experienced. And what this shows is that NASA remote sensing data can help in these phases. We saw rain, winds, and flooding um, monitoring. You can look at low-lying area. You can look at uh, flooded streets and roads. You can monitor flooding afterwards and see where there is you know, still water uh, uh, present on, on previously dry surface. You can monitor power outages during and after the storm. Um, and so all these uh, decisions can be based on some of the data that we talked about. What is important is that all these data, like GEOS5, uh, TRIM and GPM, TMPA, iMERGE, MODIS data are available. It's a long time record. Historical data are available. And so actually preparedness and mitigation, these data are very useful. These products can be looked at in your area for past so many cases of storms, and that can help in deciding emergency um, response strategy um, based on past data and then when near real time conditions occur when a storm is coming up, you can use that experience from past. So combining in situ data of damages, about flooding, about destruction from the past and uh, remote sensing and modeling data and socioeconomic data from NASA from the past, you can, you can develop strategy for how to um, to respond to a storm in near real time and also plan for future based on your past experience. So it's not just near real time information that is useful, but it also helps to look at past cases in your area and all these data to understand how storm conditions affected the, the area you are interested in. So there are some obvious advantages we talked about of remote sensing. Um, that it provides global coverage. Um, if you have just a few rain gauges, then you have very limited spatial uh, flooding or, or stream gauges provide just here and there limited information. If you have remote sensing, you have continuous spatial coverage. Um, these all data we talked about are open source and there are tools um, which help you access data, subset it temporally and specially. You can analyze online. Um, you can visualize online. 
You can also download and do further processing with GIS or hydrologic modeling, as we saw. So it's convenient that way. Um, and since we have past data, they can help you in developing strategy for current and future storms. Um, one thing to notice, though, is that uh, these are all research quality products and um, not operational products. So usually uh, it helps if you validate in your own region, looking at past cases, uh, uncertainty. If there is any, you can figure out, you can remove bias. Uh, based on your in-situ um, measurements. So that way, uh, one recommendation is that look at the data in past cases in your region so you know how to interpret it in near real time and even for future. One limitation, if, if you consider it, it's that all the data we saw, uh, they have different spatial and temporal resolution. So if you just look at um, data by using some of these tools and visualize it uh, for qualitative purposes um, it's fine you can look at the uh, images and interpret and derive information and see how you want to respond to emergency based on that if you want more quantitative information then there is uh, further analysis uh, needed so you probably want to download data for your region you may want to regrid it at certain resolution using GIS. Uh, you can also use uh, hydrologic model if you um, or people use urban flood modeling or storm surge modeling. So data can also be used for more quantitative studies. So both ways these data are useful, just qualitatively. You get images and um, decide what to do or um, have more quantitative studies where you actually look at digital data with other tools and have more quantitative um, decision making uh, like they have in ERDS, say, for example. So this brings us to the end of this webinar series. Um, I hope that in these two weeks, um, we provided information that will be useful to you, uh, especially in dealing with tropical storm related disasters. And we really want to thank you for attending this series. Um, and what we're going to do is we have a discussion session following now. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, we can also take a few minutes to explore some of the tools that we talked about, if you like. And we can have question answer a session after that. So thank you again. Back to our question answer session. But before we do that, I have a few couple of slides to show you. First of all, as just was shown, there is a homework assignment to you, and you will find the homework on um, NASA website. So homework one, which is or both homework are posted on NASA RSET site, and the first one is due next week, uh, May 24th, and so homework that is posted today is due on 31st of May. It's necessary to complete this homework on time if you want to receive the certificate of completion. Here is uh, some more information for you. And um, there is a link here. This is um, for a webinar, the training material and presentation available here. You can go to WIC webinar. Um, as uh, was mentioned, there is SAR webinar online already. You can watch that. There are advanced flood webinar. So our site uh, has a lot of information um, that you can go back and review. Uh, finally, uh, there will be a, um, monkey, a survey monkey uh, sent link will be sent to you shortly by email. Um, we always like your feedback about our webinars. So this particular training, uh, you can give us uh, feedback about what is useful to you or what is less useful to you, what else you may want to see, or uh, how we can improve our training in future. So your feedback through this anonymous survey is very important to us. So when you receive this um, email link, uh, survey link in your email, uh, please uh, complete the survey so that uh, we can uh, get your input. And that helps us 
in preparing our future training, which is better suited for um, end users like you. With that, I want to bring uh, two things um, for information here. One is uh, last time there was a, a question about this Cygnus mission, as a, uh, and that is an op, um, research mission that's a recently launched mission. And I just wanted to show you this website and leave you with um, web information uh, so that you can go back and see this has a um, there's a specific mission in Cygnus to get ocean surface winds uh, and so that is very useful for hurricanes. Cygnus is like small eight satellites flying um, around the earth so having frequent observations. So since it is an operation uh, not an operational mission so far we didn't get into a lot of detail but there was a question last week about if the surface winds are available. And um, they are available from um, uh, JPL PODAC. So Cygnus wind data are available. And you can go back and look at the uh, uh, question answer session from last week to get the information. So if you go to Cygnus data, you will have a lot of information. And from JPL, you should be able to uh, download this data. Cygnus data products, they are available. So uh, ocean surface wind speed, they are available to download here. Another question we had earlier was, can we download uh, data that we saw in Worldview? And for that, I want to leave you with this website here. It is NASA Earth Data. Earlier last week, we saw how to register for, register for NASA Earth data. And once you register for that, you can download any data. So there are, there are search here. You can find data, or you can visualize data. But this basically allows you to um, find data, and then it tells you where the data are. You go to this site, then it takes you to the website where the data are there, and then you can actually download digital data. Um, there are um, um, ways to subset data uh, in here, too. But as you can see, atmosphere, uh, uh, actual solar irradiance, cryosphere, human dimension, land, ocean, they are by thematically arranged. And you can find the data here. So what you saw in Worldview, in, it, whatever you see, those data are available, not directly from Worldview. Then you go to Earth data and then search for uh, these data and then download. So these two I wanted to share with you. And uh, if you have now any questions, uh, please type them in the question answer uh, pod. And then we will try to answer as many as we can. OK, so uh, first question that's very important, um, what's the time unit for rainfall? So when you see half hourly data, even then it would be like millimeter per hour would be the rain rate. When you go to the data and look at the metadata, this will be specifically given in there. That is it millimeter per hour. If you're looking at monthly data, if you can choose that you want monthly rain rate, average rain rate in millimeter per hour or millimeter per month that is accumulated over a month. So Giovanni provides that option. But original data usually are in millimeter per hour um, if there is just rain rate data. So any image you see or any data you see, there is unit associated with it. And that information is available either in the image or in the metadata. Yes, so question two is answered here. You can register here to get um, uh, near real time uh, iMERGE data. Uh, that is, uh, in my experience, you register on, on uh, J. Simpson. 
when you go back, it will ask you for username, that is your email address. It will ask you for password, that also is your email address. Also, if you go back and forth, you will have to um, log in again and again. Um, that, that is one of the things that keep in mind. But once you register, you can use the data, download the data. So uh, from inundation data, you cannot get water depth. But um, um, you can have a model. There, there are um, GIS-based model where you, you, you have terrain data or, um, and you can have inundation data. Based on that, you can estimate what the water depth would be. Similarly, when you look at stream flow, say in meter cube per second, it is the volume of water per second you're looking at. It's really not telling you the depth, but that information does come from the terrain data or the uh, information about the channel itself. So you're talking about bathymetry data, which you don't see along with the inundation you see here. So question four is, do you have any um, approaches for forecasting future climate? Um, so 2030, for example, there is, um, NASA is not really doing uh, climate forecasting, but I want to point out there is a, um, there's a NASA climate data service that's available. It looks at CMIP-5, which are couple model intercomparison project. It was for, uh, these are the models they were used by IPCC. Um, and so NASA provides this service. It, it uses CMIP-5 data, almost 21 models are used in there. Um, and these data are downscaled, so temperature and precipitation are available. Uh, so project, runs, I, I believe, are for 21st century. So it starts in 1950 and goes all the way to um, 2099. So you can look at that site. Um, our There's more information here. Um, the the data here, can we download these flood prediction data? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by flood prediction. If it is um, GFMS you're talking about, where prediction is of stream flow and run rainfall. Uh, you can download that. At, I believe they are in, in binary format. If you go to GFMS site, Uh, there is a data availability here from 2013. If you go to this site, you will have, say, April, and these are binary data. So you can see this. Download them, and you will have to read them using some software like Python or R or IDEA. Would it also be helpful for tornado outbreaks? Okay. Um, if the tornadoes um, in US National Weather Service uh, has information for it, NASA will not have uh, tornado information right as it occurs. It, it not not forecast. But if there is rainfall associated with our extreme weather, uh, it it that information can be available from PMM site in the extreme weather site. But usually, tornado information is available through National Weather Service.
And so GDAX also would see alerts if they are coming from local, uh, so regional or national weather services for different countries, wherever there are storms occurring, if there is, if there is a probability of tornado, those alerts in GDAX also would come from um, that information from different countries or national weather service of different countries. So uh, question seven, um, because there are multiple formats available, you can explore which is most um, appropriate for you. You can use that. Uh, KMZ is uh, usually very um, quick to look at. You can just use uh, Google Earth and put the KMZ file in and you can zoom in and see the features. So that's why we use KMZ. But um, in general, if you're just looking at images, if you want to look at image, you can see online. If you want to work with GIS, then you would use either NetCDF or GeoTIFF files. If you want to work um, with software like Python or R, then any format would work. If you are working in tools like Panoply, you can use NetCDF or HDA formats. So these are all the options available, um, and it, it is for the users to decide which format is most convenient for them to use. Um, the question is, is it true that near real-time data are not exact geolocation? Um, I, I, they, are, uh, they are geolocated. That's, that's why there is some latency after data are received, they are processed, and then they are posted. So that when we say near real time, near real time, there could be latency of about four to five hours. Um, socioeconomic data does not include flood damage data, no. So um, this is a good question. Question 10 that we, we do get it from many users that there are many different NASA products and satellites and tools. Um, there, so our set webinars, we, in each webinar, we try to provide a list of uh, satellites and sensors and tools that we use, different products that uh, we use for that particular application. So, that is one of the goals of our set trainings is to provide this information that, okay, here are a number of satellites and products and tools that you can use for um, a particular application. But if, if, you, if you, as I mentioned earlier, these are all research quality mission and product. And so they are designed, developed, and launched for for a particular objective. And so since they are there, we can use different data in different combination to achieve our final goal for application. So, um, question 11 is uh, GDAX, there's a si um, given here, a link given here. We did a GDAX webinar last year, so you can go back and view that. This year, there is no plan to do GDEX webinar. Also, um, I want to warn you that our webinar used um, old version of GDEX website. The website looks have changed now, but the same information is available there. So in future, uh, we may provide a overview of GDAX again, but there's no plan this year. Um, 
question here is, is there any correction needed for iMERGE rainfall data? So that is where, if you saw the, the summary slide, we, we talked about um, validating data locally. Because iMERGE data are produced globally at one-tenth degree, which is 10 kilometer, it's not very high resolution. Also, um, they are validated at selected places based on field campaign and aircraft data or surface data, not validated everywhere. So in your area, it is important to compare iMERGE data with, say, surface-based rain gauge data. And if you see biases, then you may want to correct uh, the data. So HDF to GeoTIFF, um, I think Python can um, help. Python can read HDF file and then you can convert to GeoTIFF. Uh, if there is a an example available from PMM, GPM applications area and. Um, if you go to applications and trainings, there are there are some uh, there is some information uh, where you would see uh, on using Python script for reading GPM data. So you can read HDF data and save as GeoTIFF. This is this this you have to change it for your own data and situation. This is specifically for GPM. So. Basically, you have to use some software to read HTF and then write as GeoTIFF. So WIC installation and running, uh, it's then um, advanced training. And uh, if there is a need for that, you can write it us in the survey. And we are planning for. Um, future, so maybe next year or so. So which is the most reliable wind? So either from any of the scatterometers or other data? That is a good question. I mean, um, all these data, they come from different sources. Their, their algorithms to derive, they are different, and their validation is done at different places. So for your own region, that's why it is important to look at different data sets and see which one uh, provides the best information in your area, which you think is more accurate for your area. So can we use the extreme rainfall detection system forecast as indicator of heavy rain warn, rainfall warning? So that is the idea here. And it is based on NOAA GFS. But basically, if you look at the forecast, it tells you where there's likelihood of uh, precipitation. And it gives you how many millimeters for um, accumulated over 12 to 96 hours. Um, so question 18, um, it says that if all, all the, when you go to NOAA, you will, you will get um, information which is either based on weather service model or their own observations. They also use um, NASA satellites and geostationary satellite information. But if you are trying to uh, look at more quantitative data, then these are the data and tools to look at. Again, I, um, in, in my opinion, the strength opinion, the strengths of 
these data that we talked about is that it has long-term coverage, you know, more than a decade for all of them. Some are close to 20 years now. And so it allows you to study. So it, it is, again, preparedness through studying past cases. So not just near real time. Near real time, you will get information from many operational services. And these data, of course, can be used very effectively, as we saw. But you know, looking at past record and then deriving a decision support um, strategy, that, that, is, that is the strength of all these data. Um, So there is, there's a question, what is meant by reanalysis product? And that's a good question. Uh, we talked about MERA, which is NASA uh, reanalysis. That reanalysis is it takes um, past data and then reanalyzes in the sense that it assimilates in situ data, also satellite data in this model. And that provides um, this production of data as if it is modeled with observed, combined with observation, so reanalyzed with assimilated data. So for um, cyclone wind, most reanalysis data perform well because in, um, data are assimilated in them, observed data. So that is true for um, weather service model also, uh, NOAA. NSEP model also uses assimilation of data, and so, do, so does uh, NASA MERA. Again, um, it, is, it is not easy to say um, that one product is more accurate than other. It depends on each cases and the region. I mean, so it is, that's why we recommend very strongly in each of um, our sessions that um, here are the data. They are validated in general, but for your region, it is important to look at this data, uh, especially for the past data. And then that gives you idea of how accurate they are. Do they need any bias correction? Um, I, I'm not sure about question 20, if these data are available um, for other small islands. Um, so flood extent and flood prediction, storm surge, you will have to go and look at the tools we talked about, which island you're talking about. Question 21, it says satellite data have variations from ground station data. So there are multiple reasons. One is that, of course, there are two different sensors. Um, a ground station would have point measurement, a ground station data, whereas satellite usually has um, a footprint that is much bigger than a small ground station coverage. It could be like MODIS is 250 meters. Whereas if you look at GPM, it is, uh, it's 10 kilometers. So direct comparison between the two is not possible. That's why, because they are looking at different quantities. Um, I mean, di different areas, your special area you're looking at. But if you look at um, time series of these two data, then that gives you information about what the differences are between a satellite what satellite sees and what the ground station sees. So that's why um, the bias correction is used. You must have heard the word bias correction of the data or correction of the data. That um, is sometimes done just so that it matches local ground station data.
Um, so C, C state and wave height, I believe that NOAA has this information. Um, there is coastal information from NOAA available. Um, is, the, is it possible to measure water depth or water catchment through terrain data? Uh, there are schemes. I'm not um, an expert in this area, but um, if you look at any hydrologic journals, you will find uh, information about how to look at water depth. Um, also, there is going to be a new NASA mission, uh, SWOT. So that, at that point, um, bathymetry or depth of water will be available. There is going to be a, a plan to, to provide that information. So again, you know, uh, question 24 is similar to the earlier question, that surface inundation will not provide you information about depth. It just tells you that when you look down from the satellite, here is the surface where there is water. How deep it is, it is, uh, that depends on what kind of terrain there is, um, what kind of slope, and so that is a uh, difficult, you cannot say that from, from satellite as yet. So is it possible to know exactly after how many days the flood water subside in any particular flooded location? Um, this would depend on, again, many factors. First of all, it, what kind of soil um, characteristics is there? If there is infiltration um, capability, before flood, how much soil moisture there was? So. This will depend again on, on very regional conditions. So I, I, I don't think I know the exact answer, how, how, to, how would you know when the flood will subside? But um, if you look at, again, I'm pretty sure that if you look at past data, um, past cases, that, give, that can give you some idea. So also RSET is planning a webinar in urban flooding. So this will focus specifically on urban area. Uh, it could be because of extreme rain or so it's something like flash flood, or it could be because of sustained long-term rain where a lot of water accumulates or because of a storm. So urban flooding itself is because of the resolution requirement. Um, it's a challenging problem. Um, also, it depends on how stormwater management is done, what kind of drainage systems are there. So there are multiple issues related with urban flooding. So um, if you have any experience in working, dealing with urban flooding, or if you are in, if you're working with um, any organization which deals with urban flooding, we would really appreciate it if you let us know now. Um, and see if we can talk to you more about that. So you can indicate that in the chat box or QA box. Um, also, we would like to learn from you um, what procedures or strategies you use in storm-related emergency situation if you have come across this or you have dealt with before. So your experience is uh, very important to us. 
uh, the information we receive from you uh, can help us um, package our information that is more useful. So if you can indicate that, that would be uh, great too. Also, what would help us is if you tell us the time latency that uh, is required for emergency response. Although NASA is not an operational agency, data are available in near real time and forecast mode. So uh, which information would help when? Uh, how many hours before? storm strikes an area or so winds, flooding, rainfall, storm surge, all these, uh, how early you start looking at if you are in emergency response um, uh, organization. So if you have any more questions, you can enter them now at this point, or you have our email contacts. You can contact us later. If we can provide you information about NASA data related to your needs, we'd be happy to do so. So thank you very much for attending this webinar series. I also want to thank our RSET team, especially uh, Brock Levins, who always helps organizing this um, Adobe meet, uh, the go-to meeting and works in setting this webinar up. I also want to thank Elizabeth Hook. She is the one who edits all our presentations and helps us in many ways. So again, thank you uh, to all the team for helping with this webinar, and we thank you all for participating in this webinar series. We hope to hear from you through the survey, um, and we'll definitely consider your feedback. It will be very useful to us for our future trainings.